Hi, I, I'm Professor Mike Sachs. I'm the chair of the Institute for Responsible Leadership. And I'm also the chair of this, um, this webinar, which is um, in combination and collaboration with um, the Institute for Responsible Leadership and UNITAR. Uh, we're very pleased to uh, be working together because we have actually just recently collaborated on a book, which is on um, which um, uh, is actually in subtitled Essential to the Achievement of the UN Sustainable Development Goals, which is edited by myself and published by Routledge. And the reason I mention this is this book is very relevant to today's session, because when we talk about the arts and responsible leadership, we necessarily are heavily linked to um, issues to do with the fulfillment of the UN sustainable development goals. And it's very important that um, in this series, that we have this series of collaborative webinars, that um, we, we actually make reference, strong reference to the arts, because um, it really does need to be given um, serious consideration as it's often neglected. And here we have the chance to really put the arts and responsible leadership on the map, which is great. The arts themselves obviously cover a very wide range of areas from painting and photography to drama and theatre, um, some of which we'll be looking at um, today. But in this webinar, we're planning to do two things really. Firstly, we're looking at the importance um, of the arts to society. And secondly, we're looking at the role of responsible leadership in taking forward um, the arts for the wider good. These are, these are going to be key aspects of um, the discussions and the presentations that we have today. And I'm very pleased to say that we have some excellent um, speakers today, including our keynote speaker, Professor Michael Scott, um, who's from Blackfriars Hall, Oxford, um, in a senior position there as Dean. And we also have um, illustrious panelists, Professor Michael Early, who's um, from um, Harlexton College, University of Evansville in the US, and um, Hassan Muhammad Ali, who is um, a specialist in diversity and the arts, and Audrey Wong, who is from Singapore, who's um, a policy expert um, in culture, cultural policy and the arts, and um, also was the, has the honor of being the first MP to be given the brief for the arts in Singapore. But first, we're going to turn to the chief executive of, um, Ju of, of the Institute for Responsible Leadership, Julie Search Whitaker. So over to you, Julie, to say a few words to set us on course. Okay, uh, hello everybody. Um, I'm speaking obviously on behalf of the Institute for Responsible Leadership or the IRL, as I will refer to it. And uh, we are really delighted to be working with UNITAR uh, and believe, really believe the work we do and the work we propose to do uh, will actually help make the world a better place. So the IRL is a non-profit making organization and promotes leadership integrity in both the public and private sectors. And we offer courses and seminars, um, accreditation, mentoring, coaching, and obviously we're involved in webinars here. Uh, we also um, support research uh, and we're always welcoming new members to um, help us with this particular uh, course. We've worked in partnership with UNITAR on several webinars, including health, education, youth, um, climate change, just to name a few. And today it's absolutely fantastic to be able to uh, work with our distinguished panel, um, looking and discussing at arts and responsible leadership. It's really hard to imagine a world without art, a world without creativity. Um, music, storytelling, painting, theater, film, you know, just to name a few. 
a few mediums. So the way that art can be expressed. And we know that it has a really vital place to pay, uh, a place to play in all kinds of aspects of our of our worlds. So we know that health and well-being uh, are positively impacted. Um, we know that through COVID, many people reported, particularly people that I, young people I work with, how the arts supported them with their mental health through that particular phase uh, in our world. Creative thinking approaches themselves um, are required to address some of all the issues that we have and, and the economic challenges we have. Uh, for example, even decisions about applying targets to the arts can be both stifling in one way, but actually um, can be enhancing depending on how they're set and the purpose behind them. The arts industry is obviously a very buoyant uh, industry in terms of economics throughout the world. Now music and art form, forms are often used uh, in political ways to raise awareness, comments about society, comments where we are in the, about where we are in the world. Uh, and they're a really strong vehicle for raising awareness. I mean, those of us who can remember Bob Geldof in the eighties, uh, maybe films like Midnight Express that actually changed the law in the country, uh, the drug law in the country at the time. Um, in the arts, you know, Picasso, his fantastic uh, Guernica, you know, and how he used that uh, to say, I'm not having this exhibited until there is um, some kind of justice in Spain. So it's a very powerful vehicle as well to raise awareness of issues in society. And socially, art is inclusive and it's accessible. I mean, in England, for example, uh, we do have free access to many galleries with art, which is an absolute privilege and perhaps, you know, provides an example uh, of an irresponsible approach to the arts through several different governments, because we still have that facility. Um, community projects are often supported for the same reason, accessibility, express expression, and, you know, a very, very important part of society. So responsible leadership within the arts also needs to ensure freedom of art, fair representation of art and true acknowledgement of art. Um, and also making sure that opportunities are, are there for all to be able to be enlightened by art, to be able to appreciate art, the benefits and the joys that it can bring and to enrich our, our lives, because they would be very sad uh, if, we, if we didn't have that from everything to do with the colours in our rooms, the, our surroundings, appreciating different forms of art and so on. So responsible leadership will help to ensure access and opportunity and chimes with many of the SDGs, as our speakers will elaborate on. So uh, without further ado, I will pass back to Professor Mike Sachs, who will introduce our fantastic panel. Thank you. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you, Julie, for those um, uplifting words. Um, and I think that what we will do now, Sarah, if I may, is to uh, move on to um, a, a, a contribution, a video message from a good friend of mine, a very good friend of mine, Alex Meyer, um, Director of the Division for People and Social Inclusion at UNITAR. Um, unfortunately, Alex uh, couldn't uh, be with us today because he's currently um, on a mission um, in New York for the United Nations, um, but he was very keen to make sure that his voice was heard loud and clear about the UN Sustainable Development Goals and responsible leadership in the arts. Yeah, I have the privilege of speaking to you from Geneva, Switzerland, from the Palace of Nations, the Palais des Nations in French, which is where the United Nations was actually uh, created in 1945. Um, it's a great privilege, I say, because we work indeed very close with the IRL, the Institute for Responsible Leadership based in London, but operating uh, globally. 
And I would like to begin by expressing my appreciation to Professor Mike Sachs and to Director uh, Julie Sachs Whitaker for the outstanding job they are making in bringing us together around the concept, the practice, the theory, and most important, the actual application of responsible leadership. Today, we will be discussing responsible leadership when it comes to the arts. So allow me to uh, share some ruminations on that. As you know, the arts can play a crucial role in achieving the SDGs. Why the SDGs? What about the SDGs? The Sustainable Development Goals. This is no more than an acronym on the 17 Sustainable Development Goals that are part of what we call at the United Nations, the Agenda 2030 for Sustainable Development. In other words, this uh, supranational roadmap this uh, global agreement of 193 member states of the United Nations to work hard to improve our societies, to achieve sustainable development in a way that has been conceived by the year 2030, that should be indeed uh, better in terms of education, health, the environment, you name it. And all of these things under Agenda 2030 and under the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, indeed require responsible leadership. So the arts can play a crucial role in achieving these SDGs. The SDGs proper call for a global effort to end poverty, protect the planet, and ensure prosperity for all. The arts can help achieve these goals by promoting awareness, inspiring action, and fostering creative solutions to complex social and environmental issues. Responsible leadership in the arts can have a positive impact on society. Uh, as you will understand, leaders in the arts have a responsibility to use their influence to advance the SDGs and to promote better societies for all. By promoting sustainable practices, promoting social justice, inclusivity, and advocating for policies that support the arts, responsible leaders can make a positive impact on society. The arts can promote sustainable development because through the arts, we can promote sustainable development by raising awareness about the environmental issues, about the fight against poverty, anything that can make you and I, our lives better, especially for people that are dispossessed, people that are discriminated, and what we call vulnerable populations. We are to encourage people to adopt sustainable behaviors and to promote sustainable development policies and practices. Now, responsible leadership in the arts can also promote diversity as inclusion and inclusion. The arts have the power to unite people from diverse backgrounds, to promote social cohesion and the like. Responsible leaders in the arts can help promote diversity and inclusion by supporting artists, from marginalized communities, promoting cultural exchange and fostering intercultural dialogue. <clears throat> the arts can indeed force creativity and innovation. Creativity and innovation are essential for achieving the SDGs. <clears throat> Through the arts, we can force creativity and innovation by providing a platform <clears throat> for experimentation and exploration of new ideas. Responsible leadership in the arts can promote also ethical practices. Ethical practices in the art are essential for promoting sustainability and development, protecting artists' rights, and ensuring that art is produced and consumed in an ethical manner. Responsible leaders in the arts can promote ethical practice by setting an example, advocate, advocating for ethical standards, and supporting ethical initiatives, among other things, to protect property rights of artists. Finally, the arts can promote lifelong learning and education, which is the mandate of the United Nations agency that I represent, MINTAR. Education and lifelong learning are essential for achieving the sustainable development goals. Through the arts, we can promote lifelong learning and education by providing access to cultural experiences, encouraging creativity and critical thinking, and promoting interdisciplinary learning. Finally, as I say, if you allow me to wrap this all, we believe that responsible leadership in encouraging the arts and, and sustainable development 
in a synergetic way also promote economic growth because the arts contribute to economic growth by creating jobs, generating revenue, and promoting tourism. Responsible leaders in the arts can help promote economic growth by supporting the arts and cultural industries, promoting entrepreneurship, and advocating indeed for policies that support financially the arts. Uh, I would like to leave behind the idea that the arts can play a significant role in achieving the SDGs and that they already do so. And that at the same time, responsible leaderships in the arts can have and have a positive impact on society. Whatever I have told you today is with the uh, commitment here at the UN and at UNITAR that the arts are indeed not to be ignored, but to be embraced and encouraged as a conduit uh, to actually achieve the societies that we have. By promoting sustainable practices, promoting social justice, advocating for policies that support the arts, and fostering creativity and innovations, the arts can help build a more sustainable and inclusive world. Again, my sincere congratulations to Professor Sachs, uh, to our dearest uh, Julie Serge Whitaker for putting this together, and to all of you, my gratitude for investing the time and effort that you will invest in this webinar and this seminar. Thank you so much. Um, I send you warm regards from Geneva. Well, um, thank you very much, um, Alex, for those uh, great words that uh, will um, provide a very important context for the rest of the webinar. Uh, that is really, really helpful in terms of setting uh, a background to what we are doing today. So I turn without further ado to our keynote speaker who has um, 20 minutes to strut his stuff, as they say, in relation to the arts and responsible leadership. I have known uh, Mike for many years and uh, he has filled some very high level positions, including being a previous university uh, vice chancellor. Um, he's worked in a number of senior positions across the globe. And more than anything, he is a world renowned expert on Shakespeare. And this has translated very much into his current role, which tends to focus on being a theater critic, an academic, and a novelist um, based in Oxford. So um, we look forward very much, Mike, to hearing your wise words. Okay, uh, thank, thank you, Mike, for that uh, introduction. Uh, can we start my slideshow, please? And uh, uh, yeah, okay. Why, uh, we've just been talking about why we, why we have, have the arts and uh, trying to link what we're trying to do today is link responsible leadership in the arts with these UN sustainable goals, which, which you can see before you. Great art goes across centuries and across countries. If you have a look at those uh, sustainable development goals, uh, as Alex referred to, you can actually summarize them within a couple of phrases. One of them is social justice, and the other is social inclusion. And that's what we're about. Now, what I want to talk to, to you today about is the fact that we have examples, and I'm gonna give examples in current practice within the UK of where arts organizations, um, uh, various ones, are actually going for social justice, demonstrating social justice, and in doing that are fulfilling or starting to fulfill some of those uh, sustainable development goals. They're pushing them. They're pushing them forward through responsible uh, leadership. So, next slide, please. Here's uh, probably one of the most famous paintings that we have in in the UK. One of the most famous paintings in the world. It's Rembrandt's uh, Girl at a Window, uh, which was painted in 1645. And you can find this painting at the Dulwich Picture Gallery in London. What the, what the gallery did in 2020 was 
make this painting part of an exhibition about women at the window. This exhibition started with art from 3000 BCE and it went right the way through to 2020, showing women at windows, showing women against not a glass ceiling, but a glass wall. Women trying to find their personality, who they are, what they can do. And what about this girl here? When we look at it, when we look at her, who is she? Is she poor? Is she rich? Is she a maid? Is she a prostitute? Note how she's holding something at her neck. Look at her clothes. Look at the cheeks. Are they diseased? What's, what's with her? And this exhibition actually demonstrated the importance of women in society and that the way that women have been blocked in society for so many years. It was responsible leadership by the gallery, a gallery which was founded in 1811 and now has its first, after 1811, now has its first female director and also has a female chair of the board of trustees. It seems to me that it's an example of the way in which the SGG's uh, goals to do with gender equality uh, are being seen. Uh, and, that, and that exhibition did precisely that. Could I have the next slide, please? Now, another Rembrandt. This is at Edinburgh. In the, in the National Gallery at Edinburgh. It's a self-portrait of Rembrandt in 1655. Look at that face. Look at the sadness in the eyes. Look at the, the brow. Look at the whole face, the way that it's calling out for pity. Why should Rembrandt want pity? Because this was just a few months before he faced bankruptcy. He faced poverty. He was thrown out by society. Uh, the greatest, probably the greatest artist that we've ever had. There it is, what we're talking about in art, showing us things about uh, the SDGs, about poverty, about, about rejection. Next slide, please. Money. Money dominates our world. And so for responsible leadership in the theater, we should actually be exposing these issues. The great crash, economic crash was caused by the, Lehm, the bank of the Lehman Brothers uh, failing. And we have the director, Sam Mendes, putting on with the National Theater in, in Britain, a production of the Lehman Trilogy. These are the three, three brothers, uh, the Lehman brothers. Notice, please, uh, skin color. They're not all white, but of course they were all white, but they're not all white as actors. That says something else about uh, the nature of theater, which I'll come to in a moment with, within Britain. But what this Lehman trilogy showed was how People ignored a natural disaster, didn't just ignore it, but capitalized from it. The Lehman Brothers made their money from the fact of the Alabama fires, which destroyed the cotton crops. They had cotton crops elsewhere, but did they go and help Alabama? No, they held back and they used their influence to get money because they could control the small amount of cotton available. And they went to New York and they made a lot of money and they became a big bank. And then what did they do? Of course they're dead, but what does that bank do? Mm -hmm. Later on, that bank fails because of hedge funding, because of the way that they have been indiscriminately of financing or using their finances. And when it came to that in the in the actual production at the end of the end of the, the third of the, th the three plays, red light just plumph 
suddenly hit the whole of the stage. Who was responsible? Greed was responsible. Greed was responsible. Now I want to go on to the next slide, please. Because it's, it's, that, was, that was responsible uh, leadership by a director, by Sam Mendes, who, of course, is the famous director of the uh, James Bond films, doing that. But we have a responsibility also as critics uh, to have a responsibility about how we make literature uh, comprehensible and how we make literature comprehensible to our contemporary society. This is one of uh, the great Shakespearean critics of the present day, Kiernan Raya, discussing Shakespeare's poetic justice in, in a book about, um, about true justice, social justice in the world. And he says this, the gulf that yawns between the rich and the poor grows wider every year and the accumulated wealth of the 26 richest individuals on the planet is currently equal to that of the 3.8 billion people who make up the poorest 50% of its population. To such a world, the drama of Shakespeare with its dream of the day when earthly things made even atone together, which is in As You Like It, and justice always whirls in equal measure, love's labor's lost, has more to say than ever. This is responsible leadership, I think, uh, by a critic of Shakespeare, it's by somebody who's trying to get us to learn about Shakespeare, to learn that Shakespeare actually speaks through the ages, as Shakespeare himself knew, because in Sonnet 81, he talks about where eyes not created will actually one day look at his work, but will see new meanings in his work. Ryan is telling us what some of those new meanings are. And I now want to go on, please, next slide. And I now want to go on to have a look at a very contemporary production of, uh, of, of Shakespeare. It's the, the Tempest at the Royal Shakespeare uh, Company, um, directed by Elizabeth Freestone, uh, and it's on at the, at the present time. What, if you don't know the story of the Tempest, it's about a duke who is exiled to an island. Uh, and he creates a tempest when the people who exiled him are going past it and he brings them to the island and it's about him getting his revenge but actually shows his forgiveness at the end. That's what the tempest is about. What we've got within this, uh, this production uh, is just a, a kind of a leadership, responsible leadership in altering the emphasis subtly. What Elizabeth Freeson does is she actually has Prospero, who is the old Duke who's, who's been uh, exiled and, and, and has magic and to cause tempest. And, and she makes Prospero a woman. So we have a female actress playing the part of Prospero. And Prospero has a daughter. So it's now not a father and daughter who have been exiled but a mother and daughter. It changes the whole perspective of the play without changing the play because you've got a maternal aspect to the play. It becomes softer, it becomes kinder. And within that, she also does something else by actually having other characters who are often male being played by females. So, the character of Ariel is a female in this in this play, can be a male or a female, but can, is a female in this play. Uh, and the character uh, Trinculo, one of the one of the seamen who is uh, who is stranded, he is also played by a female. In the play, Stefano, another seaman, fights Trinculo, but in this play, in this version, when he fights Trinculo. He threatens a woman. So topical at the present time. 
the way in which men abuse women. So, so topical. Uh, there's another uh, there's another aspect here. Well, I'll show one, one other thing here, because next to that uh, uh, Tempest is a uh, program is uh, the RSC making sustainable theatre. What she what she also does within this uh, within this direction is she actually brought trees onto the stage or parts of trees onto the stage, which she gained from uh, sustainable forestry. They were trees that had been chopped down for, sustain for sustainable reasons. So instead of creating artificial trees with iron and gum and uh, whatever, in, in, order, in order to make a scenery, she didn't, she got sustainable trees here. If she'd used the usual, the usual props, in they'd go into the waste afterwards. But here, she was actually working on something which was sustainable. And those, tr those tree trunks and so on, at the, it, within the stage, making the island, they will actually uh, be used uh, for other productions later on. They're there. They're not going to be uh, going to go into, into waste. So that was one good thing. The other thing is they had the beautiful trees and so on. But you had at the edge of the stage, at the edge of the island, where the sea would have come up, you had all the debris of rubbish that's in the sea of the plastic and the rubbish uh, that is that is there over onto uh, onto the uh, onto the onto the set. So you got right all the way through this play. You got the idea of common ideas of what we've got to do to try and gain sustainable a sustainable uh, way of living, and how we've got to get rid of the rubbish uh, of the, of our of our very rich lives. Can I have the next slide, please? Within this context, there is also a character called Caliban, who is uh, the only person on the island when Prosper arrives, and he's been treated badly. So the guy is being treated badly, and it is said that he tries violence against Miranda. Okay, does that make him an evil man? Or does it make him somebody who's just failed at something? But often people have just seen Taliban is the earth, Ariel is the spirits of the sky. But Shakespeare actually puts a wonderful, a wonderful uh, speech in Caliban's uh, mouth at a time when the, uh, the seamen are afraid. And he says, be not afeard, the isle is full of noises, sounds and sweet airs that give delight and hurt not. Sometimes a thousand twangling instruments will hum about mine ears, and sometimes voices that if I then had waked after long sleep will make me sleep again. And then in dreaming, the clouds me thought would open and show riches ready to drop upon me that when I waked, I cried to dream again. And at that point, Ariel, from high up uh, on the stage right, lean down with her hand towards him as if to touch him. Everybody is included. Everybody has social inclusion. And that's what we're trying to get to in the arts in, uh, in the UK at the moment, full social inclusion. Can I have next slide, please? And that's social inclusion. I've been talking about gender equality. Social inclusion in, it is to do also with racial equality. And here we have a, a Papa Asaidu who played uh, Hamlet in 2016. Papa Asaidu is actually English, uh, although his family comes, comes from, from Ghana. He's not the first black man to play, play Hamlet or first colored man uh, to, to play man with color to play uh, to play Hamlet. Ben Kingsley uh, played Hamlet in in 19 in 1973. But uh, and there are others who played played Hamlet, of course. But what he brought about was a confrontation about expectations, traditional expectations. It was responsible leadership. And that's what's going on with the RSC, they are giving responsible leadership. 
And now they've, they've actually, for the first time, have a joint artistic director, directors. One is woman, a woman and one is a man. They've just, uh, they've just been appointed. So we're getting this balance, this balance of the sexes. And we're also getting, of course, uh, multiracial actors uh, on, on stage. Next slide, please. Another, another, next slide, please. Another, another uh, of our great uh, theatres is uh, the Globe Theatre, Shakespeare's Globe uh, in London. It has an indoor theatre as well. And in 2022, uh, director Sean Holmes put on a, uh, a production of Hamlet, which really offended some people, but actually it, it was welcomed by a different set of audiences for Shakespeare, by young people going to see Shakespeare. On the left there, you've got how the, how the uh, set was at the beginning of the play. After the first interval, which was quite early on in the, in the play, when he came back, you had all this graffiti. What's going on? Mm. Also, Hamlet was played by George Four Acres, who's a stand-up comedian. And when he gave his soliloquies, he gave them as a stand-up comedian. And when he gave, when uh, you got the graveyard scene, uh, grave digger scene, the grave digger gave it all as a com as a comedian. Oh, horror, horror for some people, for purists. But if you go to that theatre, if you go from London Bridge down past that theatre, you go under the, by the arcades under under the bridge. And there you've got the skateboarding that kids are part of. There you've got the graffiti. Along the, the, all the way along, you've got graffiti. What he did was he brought the graffiti of the young people into the, into the, into the theater. Responsible leadership. Because at the end of that play, these young people were on their feet, cheering and shouting. They'd enjoyed it so much. Responsible leadership. Next slide, please. Next slide, thank you. Shakespeare, let me say, no, no, sorry, slide, slide before, please. Thank you. Shakespeare, uh, I have to say, is someone who presages the kind of crises that we have through the centuries. Here is a just a little quote from Macbeth in uh, scene scene three, Act Four, Scene Three. Before I do that, look at look at look at the caption. That's from a children's, a children's idea of getting to Macbeth. Look at how beautiful that painting is. And the art is to try and get kids involved in it. But it's a scene in which Macduff comes to Malcolm, who is uh, his father Macbeth had killed. He comes to Malcolm to try and see if Malcolm will come back to Scotland and become, uh, become king. I'm bringing this towards, towards an end now. But it becomes to become king. And uh, Ma Malcolm de denigrates himself. He says, and listen to these words. He says, nay, had I power, I should pour the sweet milk of concord into hell, uproar the universal peace, confound all unity on earth. If I become king, I will be a tyrant, he says like tyrants throughout the ages, from Tamburlaine onwards, I will be a, a tyrant. That is, uh, that, that is, is what he, he, he says. But as soon as he said it, and Macduff replies, oh, Scotland, Scotland, <laughs> fit to be a king? No, not fit to live. And then he changes his mind. He said, no, no, don't believe what I've just said, because actually I was just doing that to test you. I'm saying something else. And Macduff said, what? Double speak? Who do I trust? What's the news? He doesn't say this, but what, what, what I can say. What's the news and what's the fake news about what you're telling me? It's contemporary. It resolves with this. Let me conclude with the final slide, please. I started, uh, I started in education in 1974, and I've never forgotten this that happened just before I started teaching in higher education. I've taught mostly within social inclusion uh, institutions, 
I was then in Sunderland. And whilst I was in Sunderland, a lot of my students had never, ever been to the theatre. Because they came from homes that wouldn't go to the theatre. As it happened, the Royal Shakespeare Company came to the city close to us. So I rang them up and I said, would you like to come across and work with my students? And for 10 years, they did with very little cost. And I'm talking about top actors such as Ben Kingsley coming across and working with, with my students. And what was in my head all the time was something I heard just before I gave my first lecture in, uh, in Sunderland in 1974. And it was the late Sir Charles Groves. He said, you neglect the arts at your peril. He was talking to the funders. He was talking to the politicians. He was talking like Alex had been talking today. We neglect the arts at our peril. The arts make us think. The arts gives us perspectives. The arts can give us hope. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Michael, for your colorful and highly insightful um, presentation. Um, and uh, I'm sure that we will take all that to our hearts and we will move on, uh, to, that said, to um, Professor Michael Early, who is the first of our three panelists with 10 minutes each. Um, <clears throat> and I have asked the panelists to do two things. Firstly, to give their own view of the arts and responsible leadership. And secondly, to provide any comments that they may have on your um, fascinating uh, presentation, your keynote presentation. So um, what I would say is that Michael, again, is a dear friend of mine, and uh, he's based at Harlaxton College at the University of Evansville in the USA. Uh, there's a strong link there. And... Um, after a glittering career that um, began with New York University and, and, and the, U the Yale University and um, moved on to the University of Lincoln and beyond, um, he um, has um, always um, had the arts as a center point of his, um, his work. And uh, this is underlined by the fact that he has acted as director of Metal and Drama, and also as chief producer of plays for the BBC. So Michael, please hold forth. I think you may need to unmute. There we go. Thank you, Mike. Great. Thank you very, very much for those kind words. Uh, and thank you, Mike Scott, for uh, that stimulating opening for us kicking us off in an area that is, in a sense, my day job. Uh, I teach Shakespeare as well, uh, although this isn't a conference about Shakespeare, so I'll, I won't, I'll, I'll avoid talking about him here. Um, but it does point to a very crucial um, thing that I do want to talk about, which is the role of the solo artist. Uh, and I do want to take on board that there is no doubt that responsible leadership in the arts worldwide uh, can will and hopefully can play a significant part in achieving the sustainable development goals of 2020, helping to foster action, environmental solution, and the many impacts on society that those will benefit. Uh, those 17 goals that Alex Mayer uh, referred to in his welcoming talk and that Mike Scott helpfully put on the screen for us are not just to be embraced, they're absolutely essential and vital. They're is essential and vital for all of us, for life ahead of us. They're essential, obviously, for the arts. If they can fit into any blueprint for responsible leadership in the arts, it would give arts worldwide a new vitality and the new impetus it needs. However, and my remarks uh, will have many howevers in them, <laughs> uh, judging from the host of recent circumstances involving the arts globally, and I'm so pleased to see that we have about a uh, over 50 um, global uh, representatives joining us today. Um, I'll be talking about the UK in particular, but I think what I have to say has a perspective that reaches wider than just here. I think we can see that leadership in the arts, responsible or otherwise, is having serious is become is being seriously compromised 
and sorely tested at every step that leads us to the SDS deadline date of 2030. And that's just mere, a mere seven years away and beyond that time too. You will forgive me, but it's a very perilous path we take. From my perspective, leaderships in the, leadership in the arts seems to be facing, if not already in, a kind of crisis. Most would say that the arts are still in recovery following the worldwide pandemic, where lack of income and the falling away of audiences has forced repeated cutbacks and redundancies and put a strain on existing resources and infrastructure. But added to this has been new tests and trials burdening leadership and causing new leadership obstacles, both foreseen and unforeseen. And those consequences are the ones I want to talk about a bit here. What has survived, as Mike Scott, I think graphically showed us in his talk about Shakespeare, and what is always a beacon for the arts is the work of the solo artist and small groups of artists. They survive by will, passion, and imagination. And I'm going to return to that in with the second slide, but let's stay on this one for the moment. In the first slide, you see a group of images taken from the past couple of years. Um, in the center is a mural by the graffiti and muralist uh, Banksy. It's one of the seven he did uh, just at the end of last year on walls in, this, in the Ukrainian city of uh, Borodyanka, which is about 35 miles northwest of Kyiv after Russian airstrikes and shelling. Of course, it's a testament to individual artists. It's a testament to individual will. It's a testament to survival. Around that image, you see other images of protest, protests about sponsorship of the arts from oil companies, uh, protests about the loss of jobs following the pandemic and the hope that more will happen. The pandemic, of course, represented by that uh, Mona Lisa. I, I'm pretty sure that's probably photoshopped. I don't think that one actually took place. But up in the right-hand corner, you see an empty theater. Now, that theater isn't just empty because of the pandemic. That's the inside of the London Coliseum, which is home to the English National Opera, which is about to lose all of its funding and perhaps disappear altogether due to the movement of funding by the um, Arts Council England away from London and into the regions, which is a move about sustainability and social inclusion to be sure, but it's also put a lot of different operations into serious peril and the English National Opera is one of those. The arts, perhaps at institutional and national levels, and I think this could be applied to many of the countries of people who are, are following us today, are in a state of recovery. And they've been engaging in a massive cleanup and reorganization operation since the pandemic. The data is not yet there to test and evaluate how successful this recovery is around the world or what new ideas and leadership can claim impact and effect. So a rebalancing of all kinds is underway. And the question that raises most urgently is what leadership and whatever leadership is not responsible, but whatever but what is any kind of leadership effective at the moment? Now, maybe I can talk about the impediments standing in the way of this recovery. Arenas where responsible leadership can have effective address. Clearly not a precise list and all of you from everywhere will join in with your own imperatives and I hope some of those will appear in the question and answers or the chat. The serious problems as a result of the worldwide pandemic, at least from the perspective where I sit, one of those is Brexit, an issue faced by the UK is certainly having an impact on the arts, especially the traffic of arts between Britain and Europe and the mobility of artists who've been curtailed. The conflicts in the Ukraine, of course, leading to growing brinkmanship worldwide as new hostilities among world powers grow. 
There's also been a lot of shifting political leaderships and world alliances, including alliances that once formed between East and West, which now seem in peril. New hostilities among major powers mean that free trade between the arts and cultures, that vital interweaving, which the SDS has called for, has been seriously affected. Shrinking economies and the rise in cost of living put art in a category of luxury rather than necessity, leading to the fact that overall consumption of the arts has fallen seriously since the pandemic came to a closure. We will never say that it came to an end. It's really just paused, maybe. Climate, energy use, and environmental change has been a central feature of not just the strategic development goals, uh, but also in other important UN activities, like the UN Intergovernment Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, which has presented us with six assessment reports, each of which is more chilling reading than the one that came before. Approximately 3.3 to 3.6 billion people live in contexts that are highly vulnerable to climate change. Impact on the arts from that has never been more fully calculated yet. Necessary and long overdue equality, diversity, inclusion agendas, arts organizations have been taken to task for overlooking many of these EDIs and have a lot of catching up to do here. Irresponsible leadership is frequently the cause. Attention, however, has started to be paid by many arts organizations. Mike pointed the art to the uh, Royal Shakespeare Company in this country, which has certainly been doing a lot in that direction. Health and well being, which Julie uh, Whitaker uh, 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 talked about very early in her address, uh, which can be looked at in different ways, but which recent reports attributed to effective and irresponsible leadership. However, the negative effects of burnout and bad and clouded or indecisive judgment has been found to compromise a lot of leadership roles in the arts. Migrant displacement and the growing refugee crisis is another contributor we can point to. And sadly, risk adversity, which has always been a key issue in the arts, in a time of recovery, the safe course is usually taken rather than the more extreme ones. And that is not always the best course to be safe. Michael, I just wonder if you want to move on to your second slide because- Yeah, um, let's move on to that. Right on time. Yeah, yeah very good. Yeah, thank well, you. All, what I wanted to show here was that um, the, in these final thoughts about happening and more groups, grassroots and community levels. Uh, leadership is certainly imperiled at the top, but what's happening at the other end of the narrative is something quite new. And this is an example, for instance, of something called new narratives of leadership. And what happens when you surround extraordinarily socially engaged artists from underrepresented communities with mentors and advisors, providing them with tools for their mm. leadership growth and bring them in contact with world leaders. Uh, this is something that was initiated by the World Economic Forum. And it, in essence, it may be representative of a new way towards responsible leadership, away from the methodology, methodologies and theories of leadership that has governed training uh, and creating new ones. What they've done in this case is they've created a series of fellowships focusing uh, on these particular three women. And from left to right, Wanuri Kahu from Kenya, who lives and works in Nairobi as a filmmaker and science fiction writer. In the middle, Fandi Hopa from South Africa, who's a model diversity activist and lawyer. And the third to the right is Rina Effendi, an Azerbaijani 
who lives and works in Istanbul as a photographer portraying the socio-economic effects of globalized communities around the world. Now, what these three fellows have done and what the World Economic Forum has done for them is put them in contact with leadership and mentors from other parts of the world. And they've opened doors to them to look at how leadership can change from a grassroot local level as opposed to a top to bottom level. And that I think has been something that we need to watch very, very carefully. They've not finished this and they've not finished with a report, but their interim report is makes for revealing reading in that it follows their journeys quite carefully over the first year of this fellowship that they took part in. But it does point us to what I think is really an effective form of new kinds of leadership. Uh, leadership in many ways, in the arts especially, uh, need replacement. They need thriving from new blood. They need thriving from new perspectives. And certainly this new narrative of leadership, which I think is one of many, many local grassroots activities in this area, certainly show us uh, a new way uh, that we can follow. So perhaps I'll stop there, Mike, for the sake of time. Yeah, well, thanks very much, Michael. I mean, actually, um, your comments are all spot on and, uh, I, I, and really very complimentary to uh, Mike's uh, presentation. I think, you know, really, really helpful. So thank you so much. And I think with that, we'll move on to our second panelist, who is Hassan Maham Dali, who um, is a longstanding colleague of mine on the board of uh, Rose Bruford College of theatre and performance in, in London, um, who is um, a really admirable specialist in diversity and equality in the arts, who is internationally known as a senior policymaker and is also um, a published writer and playwright um, and uh, has a particular expertise in Muslim culture, as well as a whole number of other things. So Hassan, we look forward very much to hear your comments and see your slides. Thank you very much. Um, yes, if I can have slide one up just while I uh, introduce what I'm going to say. Thanks very much. Um, just to follow on actually from, from Michael early, I, uh, what Michael was saying resonated very much with me as a, as a theatre maker, as a, a director and someone who puts their own shows on the road. I toured a small show around the UK in the autumn of last year. And I can attest to the fact that uh, the ravages of COVID on the theatre industry have not dispelled. They're very much, we're very much still under a cloud. And um, I think also in, just as a, as a side comment uh, to what Michael was saying, is that I think when COVID occurred, I think uh, the arts world globally uh, thought that, that might be a time when we could kind of reflect on the arts and on the structure of the arts and the kind of stuff that Michael was talking about. And maybe that, um, that we could have a kind of reset, that maybe we're going to have to build the arts back up from the, the bottom again. Uh, post COVID, we can maybe build up the arts in a kind of different way. And lots, there's lots of discussions about what that might look like, a different kind of structure for the arts might look like, uh, both mm -hmm. in, in nation states and globally. And I think, unfortunately, it was a um, it was a path not taken, but it was certainly raised that different ways of actually the, the arts structuring themselves could have been one of the things that came out of the, the crisis of COVID. But anyway, let me go. Let me go forward to what I want to talk about, which I think is complementary to uh, both of our previous speakers, which is um, and to take Mike Sachs's um, uh, uh, injunction. How do we take forward the arts for the wider good? The question of the wider good, which is the thing that really, um, um, uh, uh, if you like, um, uh, I um, I really want to try and get my teeth into, and the notion of reducing uh, inequality has been one of the sustainable development goals. And the question of reducing inequality within the arts is what I want to uh, I want to concentrate on, and maybe uh, different ways of going forward. So very quickly, I'm going to talk from a UK perspective, uh, but I hope that um, uh, friends who are listening and watching this from uh, other places in the world will maybe it will resonate with them as well. I really hope that, that it does. But in the arts um, uh, in the UK, we do have a kind of crisis. 
of distribution of power. And that's because um, if you look at the, the stats, which I've, I've put up on the screen, there's an inequality of access to the artistic and cultural professions uh, by a continued homogeneity of senior staff which disproportionately affects people of colour, disabled, LGBTQ plus people, and those from working class origins uh, and women. So in the UK, uh, the arts really is, doesn't, it's not that it just doesn't reflect society, it doesn't reflect society in a quite extreme way, in that the majority of those working in creative occupations, 52% uh, were from privileged backgrounds, and only 16% of those employed in creative roles were from working class backgrounds, which is half that of the rest of the economy. So it's disproportionately less working class people, if you like, in the arts than there are in other professions uh, in the UK economy. And those from privileged backgrounds are more than twice as likely to end up in the creative occupations than their working class peers. And I can tell you, because I came into the arts in the mid 1980s, that um, it has got more rarefied and more elitist and um, arts uh, professionals and uh, arts leaders have been drawn from a very, very um, uh, um, uh, tiny strata, really, uh, of society uh, uh, as, as things have gone forward. And so this raises important questions. To what extent are cultural and creative occupations accessible and meritocratic if the demographics of its workforce, their social origins and their networks represent such a narrow strata uh, of society? And how can I deliver a much more representative and diverse sector if their tastes, values and attitudes reflect that narrow strata? So if you like, the production of art is obviously very, very closely related to those who control the arts. And therefore, the kind of art that is made, the art which, uh, to which uh, uh, life is breathed into, uh, the possibilities of new forms of art arising, uh, uh, what we think art is for, arts relationship with society, all these things are heavily influenced by who is, if you like, in control of, of the production of arts. And if you look at the UK, and I think it is the case for other places, increasingly it's a very, very narrow strata of people. And from that very narrow strata of people are also drawn the leadership uh, of the arts, who are the tastemakers, the people of power, uh, the people uh, that make choices. Now, why should any of this matter? Um, if we could go to the next slide, please. And I wanted to I wanted to drop in a, a, a little bit of um, a cultural theory, if you like, um, uh, something called standpoint theory, which was actually developed by North American feminist theorists uh, in the 1980s. And I'll talk about that uh, in, a, in a minute. But just to pick up on um, uh, Mike Scott's excellent presentation. I mean, he gave, I think he gave a very, very convincing argument as to why those who are sometimes pushed to the margins in the arts uh, uh, can be the innovators of, of the arts. And that's really what this standpoint theory, theory is about. The, in Shakespeare, in the in, uh, modern interpretations of Shakespeare in the UK, uh, uh, women directors, um, colorblind casting, um, uh, uh, a black man playing Hamlet, God forbid, <laughs> some critics might have said 50 years ago, um, uh, all those kind of things. You can see in the way in which maybe those who traditionally have been um, marginalised in the in Shakespearean productions and now the very people who are really breathing new life and interpretation into theatre in quite exciting and, uh, and transformative ways, uh, which um, maybe uh, never could have been realised uh, before. So the question of the value of who's at the centre of the arts and those who are at the margins, I think is very, very uh, important. Mm. And this particular um, standpoint theory kind of basically said and it's a kind of a, a, a theoretical explanation of, of what Mike Scott was saying, that those who are further from the centre of power uh, have a more comprehensive analysis of, um, of, of society uh, uh, and uh, what society actually looks like. And that's because those who are marginalised have to understand the viewpoint of dominant, dominant groups, while those in a dominant position have no need to understand the perspective of the oppressed. And let's me, let me put it in a, a kind of a, a work a work a day way. Let's say um, there are two, uh, two people walking along the road. One is an undocumented migrant. Now, you know, the undocumented migrant will be 360 aware about what 
is going on uh, uh, around them in the street that they walk down because they're undocumented, they're vulnerable. They they need to see whether you know someone's going to ask them for their passport or they're going to get to trouble or or whatever it might be. So they're very aware of what's going on around them. Now this is a slightly different view of the other person, a man walking down the street who's a maybe he's a banker, he's very well settled in himself, he understands what his role in society, he's completely legal. The notion of being illegal in society would be an anathema to him. He can walk along thinking about maybe his bank balance or where he's going to go for the weekend and so on and so forth. Two very very different views about the same road that two people are walking down. And what standpoint theory says is that the person who's got this kind of three hundred and sixty who's compelled in one sense to have this kind of 360 degree of the world um, is a person who maybe um, uh, uh, understands the world better than the person who's entrenched in their power, who doesn't necessarily need to, to, to look around them to see where they're located. They're quite comfortable in their, in their own power. And I'll, get, I'll, I'll give you um, uh, another example of this. A, um, if, you, if you move on to uh, slide three. This question of power in the arts, which I think is very, very important. I was at a conference a couple of years ago and a, a woman who was a director of a, of a large museum in the regions of the UK. I was talking about this subject of power in the arts and who, who makes the arts and who decides and so on and so forth. She said to me, she came up to me afterwards, she said, I very much agree with what you say. Uh, but the problem that I had is I spent most of my pro professional clear, career climbing up the ladder, accumulating power as I go. And that's been my rationale for actually, if you like, advancing up the structure of the arts. She said, I wouldn't know how to give power away, uh, even if I wanted to, because it's just not in the it's just not in my DNA. Um, I've, I've spent most of my life accumulating power as I've gone up the, up the structures of, of institutions. And that's and and that person could see the limitations of where they were. this kind of singular uh, notion of leadership. But she, she didn't know how really to um to um to redistribute leadership which is why as michael says the the debates around leadership at the moment are not about singular leadership they're about devolved leadership they're about some um, uh, power redistribution of power and leadership in, in the arts these are the kind of interesting debates which are going on in the arts at, at the moment and the reason is is because we need to let more people who are now at the moment marginalized into the arts to tell us the way in which they see the world in a way different from the one in which we do. So I'm going to leave with this. Um, uh, I'm an old punk rocker. So I, I, I grew up in the 19, um, uh, 1970s uh, with, uh, uh, with punk. And there's a very, one of my favorite singles was by a band called The Buzzcocks. And uh, the single was called Autonomy. And one of those lyrics went, it's a thing that's worth having. It buys you your life, sir. I want it, autonomy. And I think, to be honest, if we're in conclu conclusion, if we are to have more equitable distribution of leadership in the arts, then what we need is some autonomy at a grassroots level in the arts that Michael earlier was talking about. We need some autonomy, some kind of spaces where people uh, mm -hmm. can dream and, and explore possibilities in the arts, which the centre can't, really, um, uh, uh, can't really sustain or generate. Thank you. Thanks so much, Hassan. That's that's really really helpful, and um, I think um, will uh, lead us on to um, Singapore um, as time, the clock ticks. <laughs> well, I mean, it'd be great if we had a lot more time, but we must finish by half past three um, UK time, half past four C CET, um, and so we go on um, with those um, you know fine and important words to um, Audrey Wong, who um, I'm delighted um, to say has been able to join us because she is an exceptional person who is a cultural policy expert and um, critically was the first nominated member of parliament for the arts in Singapore, which sounds, you know, sort of an absolutely uh, pivotal position. Um, but she also uh, currently uh, works as a program leader at La Salle College of the Arts in Singapore and has um, also championed the cause of many, many artists. So, Audrey, on to you for your 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Um, I have really enjoyed listening to 
all the speakers um, before me. I think there's so many things to talk about mm -hmm. and so many things to cover in this whole area of responsible arts leadership. Um, so uh, I, I wear many different hats. Um, previously, I ran an independent arts center. Uh, I've been involved in um, civil society advocacy um, and I was a nominated member of parliament representing the arts community in Singapore's parliament. And um, currently I am an educator and I, when one of the courses I teach in my program is about the creative and cultural industries. And so that's where I will start. Can I have the first slide, please? Yeah, so um, in the last 20 years or so, right, the creative industries um, has been promoted globally as being one of the world's fastest growing sectors. It was uh, touted as, you know, where future economic development could could occur um, and it seemed to have so much promise for so many countries that are looking to move up the value chain. Um, and it, uh, this is what the UN Conference on Trade and Development has said about it. Creative industries create employment and income, promote innovation and contribute to society's well-being. Um, therefore, the creative and cultural industries actually do have a big role to play, one would say, in, in, in attaining the SDGs, you know, because if we're looking at um, building a world which, which is more equitable, uh, you know, where, where there's less poverty, um, where there's people have the opportunity to pursue whatever they want to do, um, and when the planet is in a, in a good state of health, um, that's all about well-being, isn't it? And uh, if the creative industries can do that, then surely we should have more of that. So, so goes the narrative. Um, but we, as we, but what we have seen around the world is that whenever um, governments, whether it's a national government or a federal government or at the at the regional level or local level, whenever governments decide they want to have a creative industries development policy or a creative industries promotion policy, very often there are winners and losers. Um, that's one of one of the unfortunate side effects. Um, it's not necessarily the fault of the creative industries, right? But it's often about the kind of policy that's uh, promoted or and and how it's implemented. Um, the other thing that often happens is that the um, the arts and culture becomes more instrumentalized. Um, it's the arts and culture often becomes valued for other other things, you know, not valued for the intangible or intrinsic benefits, but valued for the for their role in being able to bring in more tourists, for instance, or um, for their role in um, boosting employment numbers or the contribution to GDP, um, and 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 also you know for for better health outcomes and so on. So the arts is a means to something else. Uh, culture is a means of something else and not seen as being important or valued in society in themselves. Um, and when we start to instrumentalize the arts like this, um, very often, the, sometimes what happens is that the artists end up being on the losing side. They, uh, they are the ones who maybe are underemployed. They, um, they don't reap the benefits. They don't reap the economic benefits that the creative industries are bringing to the city or the region or the country. Um, and we've seen that in so many places around the world. Um, when the arts is funded by government um, or the creative industries is being funded and promoted, very often there's an overemphasis on delivering outcomes and, uh, and all arts managers dread this, the key performance indicators. And we are measured by how well we deliver on on results and not measured by the quality of the artistic work or the quality or even the quality of the experience that we give to our audiences. So that becomes an issue. Um, so very often artists kind of push back against this instrumentalization of the arts. And I would say that I think it is also uh, the job of, uh, of responsible arts leaders 
to also argue for a broader view of arts and culture with governments, to not have an overly narrow view uh, of measuring, um, measuring the arts based on what it can contribute, based on the key performance indicators, but to look at, to have a broader view, to understand that it actually impacts people, human lives in so many different ways and in very deep ways, as we have seen, you know, earlier, earlier tonight already. May I have the next slide, please? So um, I've been reading quite a bit about arts and cultural leadership. And uh, one of the uh, reports that I've read is called The Artist as Leader. And this was a research project that was uh, done at the Robert Gordon University uh, back in 2009. And um, the, through this project, they identified um, three main dimensions of artistic leadership, artistic organization, organizational and social. And when we, unfortunately, when we teach cultural leadership these days, we tend to emphasize the organizational aspect. So what are the three dimensions actually? So the artistic dimension is really, of course, the aesthetics dimension. Um, artists can lead an aesthetic practice through their innovations on originality um, and their influence on others. They could start an art, a new art movement, for instance. Um, the organization dimension leadership is, you know, usually when uh, the artistic leader is also um, the senior person in the company, might be the artistic director or executive director, and their role and their job is to keep the organization viable, to lead a team of people. And this is the aspect of leadership that's, um, that's very often emphasized in, in teaching about cultural leadership. And the third dimension of leadership is the social or political dimension. And this is where we often see that artists are involved in a political or social, uh, social dimension, whether because they are, their work is socially engaged work or um, they, they, they deal with political themes in their work or they speak up against injustice, or they you know, speak up on when they see something that, that, uh, that is wrong. Um, but even when an artist does not deal with social or political issues in their work, I think there is, a, there is a clear social dimension in the arts because whenever we present our work in public, we are actually interacting with people. We are out there in, in society. Um, we are interfacing with people who are very different from us. There is that interhuman relationship already. Audrey, you just have a couple of minutes, Max. If you okay, sure. Go on to another slide, thank you. Okay, just, thank you. Yes. We have so, so limited yes. time. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay, sure. Um, can I have my third slide, please? Yeah. Thank you. So, um, based on that, that the fact that the artist is implicated in the social, you know, simply by the nature of by virtue of presenting our work in the public, um, how then do we, in a way, um, leverage on that? On that, um, how do we? Uh, are we? Are we aware of that? Actually, that potential and the power of that role. And if we are aware, how can we practice our role more ethically, going beyond? that idea that, you know, we have to, that arts leadership is about organizational viability and more towards the idea that arts leadership is about, uh, well, changing. It's about changing, maybe not the world, but, you know, looking to change the world. I think that's a great idea to have as an artist. Um, and also to approach your work in an ethical way, to walk the talk. So not just to present a work that's about social injustice, but to make sure that in your everyday practice and how you run the organization, you run the company or your team, that you also practice ethically. You respect others. You ensure that there is inclusion of multiple voices, of marginalized voices. You pay attention to things like um, being more sustainable in, in what you do um, and less wastage and so on. Um, I think arts has that power actually to change people's mindset. Uh, we've seen those examples of how Shakespeare can be reimagined, you know, and Shakespeare is still 
changing people's minds hundreds of years after his death. That is the power of art. Um, so how can we as artists leverage that sort of creativity and innovation to inspire people to think differently, to look for a paradigm shift, to look at, to broaden our ideas of value beyond just the economic and to embrace a more inclusive approach in, in, in all our areas of work in today's world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Audrey. That has added yet another dimension to what is already a very intricate um, set of ideas that have been presented. And um, unfortunately, the clock is ticking. But what I do think uh, we should do, because I think all of you have engaged, all the panelists have engaged with Michael Scott's ideas. I think we should just give Mike a um, couple of minutes just to sort of say any reaction to that as our keynote speaker, uh, before I bring us to a conclusion to get us to the witching hour of uh, um, half past three UK time, half past four CET. Thank you, Mike, and uh, thank you, thank you uh, to my colleagues uh, for terrific papers. Um, yeah. As you said, bringing different dimensions. I finished with hope um, and saying that at least what the uh, these companies are doing that are still viable um, are providing hope. I think what Michael uh, said um, is something which is really uh, uh, hurting. Uh, in, in the UK at the moment. Uh, there are uh, galleries that just cannot continue. There are, uh, there are theatres that can't continue. And, and even the major theatres, like the Royal Shakespeare Company or the National Theatre Company, the National Theatre Company has said it can't do as many productions as normal. You know, everybody is finding it tight. Now, the issue, uh, I think, it comes two ways, really. Uh, what Hassan was talking about grassroots, we've got to do. We've got to do that. We've got to do it at the grassroots. We've got to find a way, as we've had to do in sport, you know, and, and in in the past, get to the grassroots and lead it through. But in doing that, we have to convince government, and that's the big issue. You know, you can't convince government by as uh, as as you were. As the last speaker was saying, you can't uh, do that by, sorry, Audrey, you can't, you can't do that just by saying we've got the art and we want to do the art. You've got to get them to change their mindset about money and where money should be spent and how money should be spent. And that's the big issue. If you can show, and I'm sorry, but it's true, but if you can show, that that the that the art is actually um, following certain uh, certain trends in government and get those trends in government necessarily mean it. So in England, need it. In England, the present government is talking about leveling up. Bang! Let's get in there about leveling up. How we get grassroots uh, art being financed as part of that leveling up agenda. Uh, and I think Sam Mendes during the COVID crisis was brilliant at doing that. There are people who got the name, their names in the major art areas like Sam Mendes, they are listened to by government. But with all the will in the world, somebody is working in Workington with a small arts company is gonna find it difficult to get people to listen to what he's doing. So we, we've got to try and get a holistic view of this within, within government. And I, I believe in what Michael said and, and what in Hassan said, uh, but we've just got to keep pounding on and trying to find, find routes to help grassroots art, but not at the expense of the artists who can actually have the influence uh, uh, with government. That's basically yes, what I sum it up at. Thank you so much, Michael, for those comments, which I think um, certainly um, uh, would 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 uh, get the agreement of all of us. I've been so impressed 
as chair with um, the extent to which we were all on the same page in terms of moving through moving things forward albeit you know different kind of cuts of the temperature and I I, I would also um, I would also say that I wouldn't want other colleagues in the art who may be listening and we're very appreciative of the globe the large global audience we ha we have um, I wouldn't want them to feel excluded if they haven't been mentioned so far because I'm very conscious that one of the areas that I've been involved with in the past has been fashion. And, you know, there are big debates there about the materials that are used. You know, we've moved on from crocodile skin handbags and we're now actually talking about using sustainable materials. We're also talking about moving away from exploitation of labor in, uh, you know, the global south um, in terms of sustaining industries and companies. And I'm very impressed by the fact that none of our panelists actually mentioned Damien Hurst and the exploitation of animals in terms of the uh, the claim that he has has been either directly or indirectly involved in the killing of over one million creatures worldwide, mostly butterflies, but nonetheless, you know, they're all creatures of the world. And in terms of the sustainable development goals, you know, we need to be conscious of the creatures on land and the creatures on sea in terms of the SDGs. And that's really important. But what I would like to do is two things, actually. I'd like to conclude with a quote from Andy Warhol. Um, and Andy Warhol once said reputedly that art is anything you can get away with. Um, I think that our excellent speakers today, the panelists and the keynote speaker, and indeed, you know, Alex Mayar and Julie Search Whitaker have all made the, um, the, the case for saying that, no, it isn't anything you can get away with. It's actually um, only what can be guided by responsible leadership um, in terms of value to society and the contribution to the um, fulfillment of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And after that, I just want to give a vote of thanks um, if Sarah, you could go on to the final thank you slide, um, because I think that our speakers have given us um, an absolutely uh, excellent view of um, the, the pitch in terms of uh, the arts and responsible leadership. And I'm very thankful to Mike Scott, to Michael Early, Hassan, Muhammad Ali, um, Audrey Wong, um, Julie and Alex for their excellent contributions to this uh, recording. And of course, to Sarah Ben Sharif for her coordination of the webinar from UNITAR. So thank you very much, everyone. And goodbye. We did it. We thank, you, thank you, Mike. Thank you. Thank you very much.